Hey, this is Bert Sperling. I'm the president of Best Places, and here we have our team. In today's topic, we're going to be talking about cryptocurrency, blockchains, NFTs, and what it all means. We'll try and sort it out uh, by talking among ourselves, and uh, hopefully you'll learn something too. Let's go around the room and introduce everybody. Go ahead, Nick. Hello, everyone. Uh, once again, Nick Arnold, uh, map guru, data analyst, kind of jack of all trades at Best Places. Cool. I'm Bertrand. Um, I am the social media PR person and general research and advice. Hi, Al Olson, CTO of Best Places. I'm excited to talk about cryptocurrency today. So, the so um, wh wh what are we talking about? And, and I, I guess it's all this cryptocurrency that they're that people are are referencing it's it's based on something called blockchain can anybody explain that quickly um what it is so we know exactly what we're talking about so at a, at a really high level um basically what blockchain is is a it's a technological architecture as, and you can think of it as kind of like a basically a, a ledger or a spreadsheet anything you're keeping track of um it's a way to keep track of events or transactions that occur. And within this uh, blockchain infrastructure, um, basically what happens is it relies on uh, agreement. So you develop a network of essentially called the chain of blocks and each computer ha is on this certain network. And essentially uh, this these set of computers in the network basically check to make sure that all of they each of them have a copy of the ledger and they make sure that essentially the copies are unchanged or are the same. And so in within this network, this blockchain of computers, it's checking these things and it basically just creates an opportunity to uh, have a really pretty secure infrastructure because it requires agreement amongst all of these various nodes. So essentially a ledger. You know, everybody has a copy of it. And if anything changes, you have to have agreement amongst all of the various copies of this essential ledger uh, to make sure that a transaction is legitimate. Um, it's unchanged, unimpeachable at that point in time. So hopefully that makes sense. So Nick, pulling way back, is it a way to sort of track anything? Who owns it? when they got it, how much they paid for it, if they paid it or paid for something. And so it's it's a way, it's a sort of a public way of tracking some item or something through time and through ownership. W would that be sort of an overall view? Yeah, essentially, and it really can be anything. I think it's easiest for most people to understand it thinking about, you know, banking, uh, just because, you know, you're making transactions when you buy things. Um, so you can kind of imagine anything you purchase could fit into this sort of blockchain technology, uh, because again, you're you're making a transaction, and all the all this blockchain is doing is it's helping you keep track of those transactions, what happens, uh, and where. Okay, so it's 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 decentralized, right? That's like kind of the point is that no one, because you're all adding to this blockchain, um, and then it goes up in the cloud, and then everyone gets a copy of it or maintains a copy of it then it's not like one person can own it own the ledger kind of and then make um you know changes to it and and stuff like that right so the fact that it's decentralized is seen as a as an asset to the whole program right absolutely yeah 100 percent um you know i think there's a there's certainly an element of trust in there that people are considering and you know people tend to like the the concept of anything being decentralized because then it's taking the power out of one player's hands. And in this case, yeah, everybody in this network or this blockchain is able to go through and make sure that everything that's happening is is not being manipulated, uh, you know, when these events are occurring or these transactions are being uh, tracked. And when you say events, that, that'd be like, let's say I buy a car from you for up one Bitcoin, which would be, you know, about $70,000 right now. Um, and th so that would be one entry into that blockchain. So we record that. Into yeah, the blockchain. yeah, quite literally. Um, and to be honest with you, what happens is when you, you know, if you were to purchase something like that using a blockchain technology, 
it would eventually propagate through the network of computers. You know, like I mentioned, that the ledger kind of concept, it checks through each of one of those. So, you know, decentralized, yes. Um, and yeah. Yeah, the, I, just a clarifying note, though, not all blockchains are decentralized or they call it DeFi. Uh, there are some that are centralized, um, but it's typically older blockchains that are centralized. And um, so some of the, you know, we were talking about the example of buying the car. Well, some of those involve what's called smart contracts on decentralized blockchains. And, you know, the contracts are uh, binding agreements that, you know, happen on these blockchains. So, for example, another example would be, let's say I want to buy Ethereum or, or some other cryptocurrency. Um, I could take my fiat or my, my U.S. dollar and I could take it out of my bank account and then convert it. Uh, through an exchange or a wallet to from my fiat money, my U.S. dollar into Ethereum. And uh, you could do that through a smart contract. Can you get a little closer to the mic, Al? I'm, I'm, I'm not hearing some. There we go. Yeah, I'm turning. No. Or I can move the, move the mic oh, closer. Pretty, Is that yeah, a lot better? Yeah, that's a lot better. You get to see your face better, too. So that's a win. Oh, good. Okay. Cool. Um, so anyway, so we're talking about buying a car and we're also talking about fiats. Uh, are those related at all? Or um, when you're talking about fiat currency, you're not talking about cars, right? <laughs> no, no. Fiat is uh, typically it's your regular currency issued by your government. So like if I'm in... Um, the United States, it's the U.S. dollar, or if I'm in China, it's the yuan, or the you know, Mindibi or whatever. They have another name for it too, or something like that. Right. Um, okay, that's pretty interesting. So, and then the cryptocurrency is that the same as blockchain, or or what's the what's the difference? Well, yeah, you could think of blockchain as the the network that the cryptocurrency is stored on so for example if you if you buy uh, ethereum or let's say you buy tron which is another cryptocurrency you would buy tron on the tron blockchain um, and that's where it would reside and that's where you're your ledger or your money would be okay. sitting. Um, okay, that, that's pretty interesting. Hey, I read an int I heard an interesting podcast where they had sort of a pros and cons about uh, some uh, some professor uh, of economics uh, talked about the whole notion of um, cryptocurrency, and then uh, they had someone who was a an investor and, and quite bullish on the whole idea of cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. And uh, the professor brought up some very interesting points, which was that uh, Bitcoin is wants to be both a uh, a currency and an investment. And people these days are using it as an investment. And it's if you're going to have a currency, you really can't do both, and you shouldn't be doing both with it. Because is anyone really using Bitcoin these days to buy and sell things? Uh, say uh, you go to a supermarket, you're not going to use Bitcoin uh, to pay for your groceries. So it's not really a currency in that way. It's turned into an investment vehicle. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And he, he laid out a bunch of um, points that uh, pretty well destroyed the fact that it seems like that um, Bitcoin is more of a speculative investment rather than a currency itself. Now, other other one there there could be a cryptocurrency that could be better for that but it seems like there are a lot of issues with using a cryptocurrency for instance here's something maybe you guys can explain to me i don't understand 
for instance, Nick, you talked about how you have uh, sort of common servers and it, it, uh, the uh, transaction propagates through the servers and, and becomes sort of a public record, uh, mostly. And But that can take like two or three days, I think, for something to sort of become, how can some, why should, say with the internet, we have distributed servers and things we things happen immediately and with a credit card transaction things happen immediately but with cryptocurrency it can take days for something to sort of be locked down and fully registered well bert uh i've done some cryptocurrency uh trading and it's uh every blockchain you're on has different mm -hmm. speeds um bitcoin is actually one of the slowest blockchains out there. Uh, but the transactions happen uh, with Bitcoin within a oh, minute okay. or two. And if you get on other blockchains like Tron, your transactions happen in seconds. So it's propagating out to all these different computers on the internet in sub-seconds. Yeah, it's happening based on a network of computers as well. So the network is connected in, in a you know in a kind of a traditional sense, but when it's validating transactions, my understanding is that you're only going to validate transactions for maybe eight or ten or twelve nodes, which are computers that are essentially connected to your network, and sort of like uh, mm -hmm. uh, how do I describe it? It's it's sort of like a you know you tell your friend your eight of your friends something each one of them tells eight of their friends something and eventually it propagates to the whole network of people and it's kind of the same sort of thing so it allows transactions from my understanding that to occur very quickly but it does take time to propagate through the entire blockchain i, I don't know too much about like the agreements so like how many agreements between how many nodes are required to make various things happen but i do know that it only requires you know, to reach out to a certain number of nodes because those nodes can reach out to their nodes and their nodes and their nodes and so on and so forth. Yeah. Yeah, and every blockchain has a different number of nodes that it has to validate before the before the transaction is validated. Um, and then, you know, back to your point about uh, is Bitcoin an investment or is it a is it a currency? Uh, recently, uh, you know, with the addition of uh, Bitcoin as a as a payment method on PayPal, and with companies like Tesla, it's really changed uh, just recently as to what cryptocurrency can do for the average consumer, and also banks are starting to allow cryptocurrency investment uh, from fiat right at the bank as uh, cryptocurrency gains popularity. What the banks are realizing is that they're missing out on all these funds that are leaving people's accounts to the crypto exchanges. Well, why, why would I want to pay anything? Why would I want to pay my bill with say Bitcoin when the price was six thousand dollars last year uh, for a Bitcoin, and now it's seventy thousand dollars, isn't it kind of tough to uh, count on that? I mean, it could be, you know, I, I could be accepting something, uh, you know, seventy thousand dollars. I could be accepting that, but then by the time I cash it in or change it to real money or, or whatever, it could be back down to $10,000. I mean, something that volatile. I mean, does that make it hard to do business with? Um, well, there's, uh, there's different currencies in crypto and there's a lot of different types of currencies that are called stable coins. So, an example of a stable coin is uh, USDC, which you could you could buy as a cryptocurrency, and it follows the dollar, the US dollar. So, if you buy something like that, then you wouldn't miss out on yeah, a transaction. But doesn't that like get kind of circular? <laughs> I mean, you have a cryptocurrency based on the dollar. Oh, and we love cryptocurrency because it's not 
related to, it's better than the dollar, but wait a minute, we're basing it on the dollar, this one cryptocurrency, it gets kind of, kind of weirdly <laughs> chasing its own tail. Well, uh, there's actually a very good reason yeah. for it because when you're, uh, let's say you're trading cryptocurrencies and you want to jump in and out of the cryptocurrency market, it's it's good to have a stable coin because then you can rest from all the highs and lows from all these different cri cryptocurrencies. And you can say, okay, I, I made 10% on this cryptocurrency. I'm going to trade it back into USD without having to go through the hassle of going to a bank, which would, could take a, l a large amount of time. Well, well, well to me, uh, and then to me, what you just said sort of proves the whole notion that it's an investment. It's a speculative instrument as opposed to a currency. And, and that is basically proof right there. That they have. Some. Well, that's, that's true. If you're buying things like Dogecoin, which are just memes, but but one of the things that um, that we should probably talk about is there's quite a number of people throughout the world who don't have the ability to do sure. banking. Uh, for example, if you're in a, a country where you earn, let's say, $10 for the week, you put it in a local bank and the next week it's worth $9 or $8 because of inflation. And a lot of these uh, people are, you know, not able to make it uh, as a result of all these things that their government may yeah. be doing. So by throwing their money into crypto, it's not being devalued. And so, uh, it, it allows people in, you know, third world countries to get ahead at that point. Yeah. As long as, as long as it is, remains stable enough. Um, right. And there is a lot of, uh, a lot of stable cryptocurrency coins out there that they can put their money into where their money is not getting devalued. And it, uh, the term that they're using is called self banking, which a lot of, Individuals throughout the world don't have that ability, except for. Are, do do we have any numbers on that? Like, a lot of. I'm on the fence about the whole crypto thing and and Bitcoin and all the other ones. I'm on the fence about it as far as what I believe, but isn't there a lot of kind of virtue signaling against the? Because I've noticed people who are into crypto, are very very passionate and sometimes really aggressive about anyone questioning the the great wisdom of of bitcoin and blockchain and everything like that isn't isn't it kind of when i mean how many people in africa are actually buying cryptocurrency and being able to dig themselves out of kind of uh you know out of the hole they're in isn't there basically what i'm saying is i feel like a lot of people who are really bullish on bitcoin and crypto are people who use these kind of virtuous arguments to justify the fact that it's that it's a I think it's for them is they're they they're either already holders of, of people. So this is I mean, let's be honest, because Bitcoin has a finite, there's a finite amount of Bitcoin, right? To be mined, period. Like yeah. Satoshi, mm -hmm. um, who is the the crazy architect. founder, the architect of it. We don't no one knows who he is. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, you know, he built in the fact that there's a finite number. I think it's 21 million or something like that. And there's been like 14, 50, and then each mining session, ha like halves it, halves the time or, or doubles the time it takes to 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 get that session. But isn't this people who are? Isn't a lot of the virtue signaling like, oh, it's going to help people in Africa, or? I mean, I'm just wondering how many people are actually using crypto and that's not even bitcoin though too that's al you were saying other kinds of crypto are going to help people out of poverty um isn't that isn't that a lot of people isn't that people kind of virtue signaling saying how this is going to help the world when really they just want to make money that i mean really they're just yeah those are those are really good points you're bringing up 
Um, so the crypto market as a whole has, um, it's either on par right now with Apple as a company or bigger at this point. So its valuation is over $2 mm -hmm. trillion, dollars, which you can't ignore. I mean, that's a lot mm -hmm. of money. Um, and the other aspect of it is that um, more and more businesses are accepting it as an investment piece and banks are starting to accept cryptocurrency as a form of of, of currency isn't that, isn't, as well. Yeah, isn't and that so, just because they want to make money too? I mean, that's what happened with GameStop when when or GameStop when GameStop thing happened. You started seeing Merrill Lynch and and everyone like the big people trying to make money off that short squeeze or, or the right and also the rising. Um, the, the you know the, the the way GameStop blew up for a couple of weeks there, but um, yeah, yeah, and those are all all uh, valid. What one of the things that um, I I am bullish on crypto right now because one of the things I've noticed is that let's say I earn a thousand dollars and I want to invest it, if I put that in my bank, I'm going to get one percent on or if that maybe two percent interest off of my thousand dollars if i convert that into cryptocurrency um there's a lot of different investment opportunities that i would never be able to find in stable cryptocurrency coins that are upwards of nine ten eleven twelve percent mm -hmm. Um, that on that same year? money, and so yeah, mm -hmm. APY. So what what you realize is that by storing my money in the bank, the bank's making the money off my money. Right, I'm not. Right, and so by storing it in crypto, you're taking that middleman, your bank, out of the equation, and you're getting your interest, and not somebody else. Right. Right, exactly. Yeah, I mean, but that that argument also applies to the general stock market too. Last year, the the total stock market index um, was up forty seven percent. The Nasdaq was up sixty nine percent last year. So, uh, and that's that's. I mean, last year was crazy. It's much it's much better this year. But um, but I mean, you have you have. I'm I when I'm paying attention to these arguments and stuff like that. Again, I'm on the fence. I'm a, I'm a I love new things and new technologies, so I always want to believe in them. But it also seems like a lot of the Bitcoin people are people who are already in the party, and they already if they if you already own Bitcoin, you benefit by being an evangelist of Bitcoin because there's a finite amount of Bitcoin. If I get you to buy Bitcoin, you've bought it at the current price, but I bought it two years ago or a year ago. And so I'm literally making I'm making money because you joined. So it sounds like, you know, that aspect of it I think can't be ignored. And that's and that's and that's why the banks I think the banks got and people like Elon Musk and the banks got pushed in. I mean, Elon Musk did it for a meme because he just messes around and does whatever he wants, you know, to to kind of have fun and do memes and everything like that. But um, um. But banks, I think, got pushed into it um, because it was like a game, a GameStop type thing where everyone's using it. And I think the banks saw that they could pro uh, profit off of it. So if they start accepting it, great, that's more money for them. So, I'm, yeah, that's, yeah. <clears throat> we Real have quick a question. Yeah, how, many how, many, uh, how many of us have actually seen a business uh, wherever we are that actually accepts Bitcoin? Personally, I've seen actually one business that was actually taking Bitcoin. Uh, but it was just one. I'm just kind of curious if you guys have seen it before. Yeah, I, I have. Um, and there's a lot more. It, it's like this year, it's gaining a lot more popularity um, as there's a lot more avenues for for businesses to accept mm -hmm. it. You mean like a physical business, Nick, or just? A, yeah, yeah, any any place you've seen right. that accepts right. Bitcoin. No, I haven't. And that's a good idea. I mean, the early adopters always win. Like there's like an NFL player, like, you know, a couple of years back who demanded to get his salary in Bitcoin. Now he's like a gazillionaire. So if I could go back in time and buy Bitcoin. So I, I want to ask this question of the room. 
is is buying Bitcoin now a good idea for someone when kind of it's it's been pretty vol it like Nick or I mean sorry Al you said that it's gone up six hundred eighty percent in the past year so that's obviously enormous so it's going through a bull cycle right now and we've been talking about that but um and obviously you know I wish I had a friend in L A who was a crazy guy just he was crazy he had all kind of scams and schemes and stuff like that but he he told me about Bitcoin back in like eleven. Well, I wish I would have, obviously, I wish I would have taken 500 bucks and just bought some Bitcoin because I'd be like sitting pretty now. But um, is it a good time to buy now? Is it, I mean, is it, is it, is it still, because it seems like everyone's talking about it right now of all ages, kind of like the cat's out of the bag. Are all the good gains already over or should I still buy some and, and uh, sit on it? Well, there's yeah. So there's a difference between Bitcoin and what are called altcoins. So everything that's not Bitcoin is called an altcoin, and there's you know thousands of altcoins out there. Uh, we talked about a few of them, like Ethereum, Dogecoin, Litecoin, uh, Chainlink, um, Clever, and so all of these altcoins. A lot of them are very cheap and overnight they'll turn into a thousand percent gain um, just in one day. And so there's a lot of people that are becoming instant millionaires because of altcoins, not because of Bitcoin, because Bitcoin doesn't move mm -hmm. as much. Um but also the earn versus true is if you invest in an altcoin and it goes down, you could lose yeah. money as well. So it's not, it's not a, uh, a guarantee, but um, overall, generally speaking, the market, uh, the altcoin market has been doing extremely well in 2021. Okay. Well, it, you know, and then there's the whole thing of NFTs, which are the non-fungible tokens, which are basically using mm -hmm. the blockchain to establish the um, prov provenance or the ownership, the origin of something. And then people are basically owning that item, whatever it is. It could be, it could be a, um, an article in a newspaper. It could be a picture. Uh, could be a JPEG, could be anything, but you've established ownership. Yeah. You know, just as an overreaching thing, you know what I see? I see that there's a lot of money sloshing around in the um, in the world, uh, and as Al pointed out, you don't want to put it in the bank because you earn absolutely nothing. Uh, U.S. Treasury bonds get you absolutely nothing as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in fact, uh, some banks or, or some countries are actually have a negative interest rate on investing in um, their bonds where they will charge you money just to park <laughs> you park your funds in their bonds. Right. It's, it's crazy. But so the, people have a lot of money these days because of the pandemic, nowhere to spend it, and they're spending it on all sorts of things. And I think it's basically a sign of the times where they're looking for places to, to, to put their money, to have some fun with it, to speculate with it. And it's just driving the price up. And we haven't got to, to the place where the stock market is going down, where uh, inflation is out of control. It'll be interesting to see what this is actually worth to people when they don't have extra money to play with and they get down to um, the necessities uh, of paying the mortgage uh, with this money, are they really going to make an investment in a speculation like this? So I see it as a sign of the time that where things are. What do you guys think? NFTs. Um it's tough for me to buy anything about an NFT because you know, it's it's creating a an opportunity to own something digitally that you had access to, or you can take. It's it's just a pride of ownership, collector's item type thing. And apparently, I don't have the financial wherewithal to really get into that market. Um, 
I don't have the funds sloshing around to throw it away on NFTs. And <laughs> I can't imagine once you buy a six point six million dollar Beeple image, I still don't even know who the hell that is. <laughs> um, you know, you're probably mm -hmm. not going to sell that again for six point six million dollars. Or maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. I could be wrong, but you know, uh, and Nick, that's sixty nine million dollars. Oh. Sorry, <laughs> right? I'm my mistake. <laughs> yeah, I don't know though. It's 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 hard for me to fathom, but maybe I'm just old enough to still appreciate a good old fashioned baseball card. Yeah, and speaking of which, uh, the biggest winner for NFTs is a website called NBA Top mm -hmm. Shot, where people are buying NBA what are called moments, and they have like like a pack that you can buy like baseball cards or you know way back in the day and it just recently received a two billion dollar valuation so there is um there are some winners in the nft space but overall nfts were uh a big new thing but they've lost a little of popularity recently, uh, except for this uh, NBA Top Shot site. It seems to be going extremely strong because they've figured out a way to make it desirable for people to own. And uh, it doesn't cost a lot of money for the average well, user. Well, I'm reminded uh, the director, Alfred Hitchcock, turning this around as I always do to Alfred Hitchcock. Uh, the director uh, had this term for uh, the movie plot and the movie plot goes, you know, something happens, you have your characters and, and basically everybody's after something, they're chasing after something. And it doesn't, to, to, to him, it didn't matter what it was. He called it the, the MacGuffin, some, some word he, he invented. So um, <clears throat> he said, you know, uh, my thought is that these NFTs, it doesn't matter what you spend money on. It's all a MacGuffin. Basically, you're establishing something that nobody else has. You're grabbing it. Who cares about some monster dunk that somebody nailed you know, in some game? And right. basically, that is a worthless thing. But you have put a marker in the sand and saying, this is something. I paid this much money for it. How much are you going to get? Give me for it, or, or something like that. And so that's the MacGuffin. Doesn't matter what it is. It could be uh, a JPEG. It could be a oh, I don't know. Uh, you know, we could have our list of best places, and we have the list of best places, and we sell the list of best places as an NFT. Doesn't matter what it was. You know, Raleigh, South Carolina is number one. That that that. That Raleigh, Carol, South Carolina, or North Carolina, as number one, we sell it as an NFT. What is it? I don't know, but the fact is that you know we established something and sold it, and then suddenly it's tradable. It's a MacGuffin. Yeah. What? Yeah. One of the one of the issues like uh, collectors have had over the years is, let's say you buy a paper card that you say that we, we establish a value for that. Well, how easy it is to copy a baseball card or a football card or a, you know, some, something that's tangible. Um, and so the NFTs solve the issue of making that unique and, you know, one of a kind, um, which, you know, for a collector, there's something to be said for that because you can't copy it. Can't copy what? You can't copy the digital NFT. It's it's non a non fungible token. It's okay, unique. I can copy it and there's I can I can look at it. It's just the blockchain has established that I own the original, but the collection of bits right. is exactly the same from thing to thing. There's nothing to establish that as being non-identical to anything else well that's why you have blockchains and blockchains make it a unique piece of digital code that you can't copy okay well lost me there because i think you can okay. copy the blockchain just establishes ownership 
for whatever that's worth, whatever people say it is. Right. I get uh, it. I'm not doing a good job of describing it then because uh, one of the, one of the reasons for blockchains is to make something unique so that you can't copy it. So I understand where you're coming from, where you're saying, Oh, it's just the digital whatever. And you can copy anything that's digital. Well, when you, when you take something digital and you surround it by a smart contract and you identify it as this piece of digital code and it lives on that blockchain and there's nothing else on that blockchain that could be copied as you, as that same unique thing, then you, you've created a unique copy of that digital okay. code. Well, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I think, I think the resale, the resale value of these NFTs and the resale market is going to be what determines. I mean, I would, I would never, I mean, I would never buy an NFT. Um, maybe it's from a, maybe it, I have seen on Twitter, like some comic book artists and some fantasy artists who have kind of lived in the middle range where they've sold stuff for maybe a hundred thousand dollars, $70,000. $50,000, some really cool like fantasy sci-fi art, like comic book um, artists and stuff like that. Um, but I don't, I don't know who's going to then buy that again. So I think the resale value is like um, where, it, where, it, where the whole market is going to be determined. You got a lot of initial people jumping into the NFT market because they want to be a part of it. And, I guess they, I guess they assume that it's going to go up. I, I, I'm, I'm still cynical about some people saying that. I feel like the defense of the of uh, the NFT thing is, um, a lot of times like again like a false virtue thing. Well, I really want this piece of art for myself, and I, and I want to have that that thing that, that um that uh is is blockchain stamps with i'm the owner but where does that where why why else would you want that unless why would you why would it be such an important thing to signify chain of um chain of command or chain of control over that thing unless you wanted to resell it Mm -hmm. good point so it's almost like they're saying well i really like this piece of art but it's really important for you to know that only i own it why is that then so um th- only so you can resell it you know good point so it's kind of like kind of like some people are like talking out of um you know both sides of their mouth like i really believe in the virtuous part of this but by the way i want to make i want to be really rich too yeah well right it's i think a way of establishing ownership ownership so you can speculate on it and hopefully profit from it i think maybe we're we're thinking about this too deeply and people just wanted to spend money just like Bert was talking about. Honestly, um, yeah. we're mm-hmm. talking about everybody having so damn much money. It's like, well, okay, where am I going to put it? I don't know. Top shots. Cool. By the way, when they sell people top shots online, they literally have a physical photo of like an old school pack, like a plastic pack as <laughs> it's sold as the photo. Like you're getting a tangible item. But you're not. <laughs> it's, it's, it's right. funny. It's funny, but you know, it's, uh, People just have money, just right. want something to do with it. I mean, that's that's it, right? You know. Yeah, it's it's also it's also pretty meta too. There's two there's two kind of anecdotes that I have about the NFT space, which help anchor the whole thing for me. One is that sixteen that famous sixty nine million dollar sale of that NFT that a bunch of stories have been written about. Well. Like who the hell bought that? Who the who the hell has seventy billion has seventy million dollars to to basically you could I mean you might get the money back, but it it's basically just almost throwing it away or almost just saying hey whatever I'm going to buy like another super yacht or something. Um, the other thing is what's weird about that situation. The addendum to that is because now that thing is a famous NFT, then maybe it could go up. Say I I want to 
because because now that that NFT is like famous and there's been all these um, articles written about it, it's almost like some the next guy comes in and says, "Hey, I want to I want to be the owner of that NFT," which kind of is like a a big thing now. It has a lot of notoriety. So then I'll get I'll sell it for a hundred million. So it actually creates itself in this weird meta way. And a lot of those cryptocurrency guys have so much money and they can't pull it out because there's a a real world penalty for taking that money out. And so sometimes that money just has to live in that yeah, digital world. Yeah, a tax world. event, right, Al? Right, a tax event. And which, I mean, if you have that amount of money, you could take it out, but then you lose the ability to make even more. And so they're using these NFTs as a way, oh, well, if I establish myself as, okay, I bought this, you know, potentially in the future, it could rise in value. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, what do you think for our turn? Have we, have we exhausted the subject or is there more to say? Um, I think so. Does anyone, does anyone, so Al, you have, you have a lot of, you have Bitcoin. Um, I have, I have, I don't actually own any Bitcoin, oh, oh, you, oh. Uh, but I, I have, um, some altcoins, mm -hmm. uh, which I think the altcoins are much better than Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Um, it's just my personal opinion though. Um, how do I feel about crypto blockchain NFT? I think that um, it was something that somebody said should have died five times over, but kept coming back. And I think that as we move forward in the world, it's going to have a place and a purpose and will become normal in the future. Um, how that's going to look, I don't know. But... I am personally bullish on blockchain and crypto um, and even NFTs because I think that they're going to solve problems that we have today that can only be solved by these avenues going forward. Um, and I think it'll evolve over time, just like um, you look back and you think, uh, well, Blockbuster video, there was no way that thing was ever going to die. It was the biggest video store yeah. ever. And then yeah. guess what? Digital movies came out. And nobody would have imagined that within a matter of just a few months, that store died yeah. overnight. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's the same analogy here where, okay, I have my paper money in my wallet, you know, and nobody can take that away. You know, that's what I use. That's what I'm saving. I put it in the bank. Well, at some point, things change in life. Mm -hmm. And that's that's the only point I am I want to make is that things do change and you have to evolve mm -hmm. with it. So so let me just give a give a, a follow up question to your answer, Al. What kind of steps or what kind of events would have to happen before we can really say Bitcoin or blockchain is here to stay? Because we've already we've already had like well, banks pick yeah. it up, but what's what's that thing where you, you can't kind of argue with it anymore? You can't even have this discussion. Obviously, it's it's here to stay. Well, okay. Let's say I live in Brazil or Ethiopia or Nigeria or um, or Turkey. What's what's my currency doing for me? And is it going to compel me to move into cryptocurrency? And I think the answer is, yeah, it's already happening. Ooh. So I think there is a real world, a real world case for people throughout the world accepting this as a way to help themselves help themselves out of poverty. Okay, gotcha, cool. What do you think, Nick? Well, <clears throat> I mean, I'm pretty bullish on blockchain and. In general, uh, the technology, I think, in its current form probably won't resemble resemble what it looks like in 10 years, how it's used, especially NFTs. You know, we're talking about people using it for art collection or baseball card style things. But in reality, Al's right. I mean, 
NFTs, if you think beyond that, if you think about creating and you know owning digital anything, it's a it's probably a vehicle for you know um, having better digital rights set up. You know something along those lines. You know for your own work or a company's work or whatever it might be. So I think there's there's a future in it, but I'm not particularly bullish on its current form. You know, I, it's probably like silly kind of you know play money type thing now, and you know it's just coming on board and gaining a lot of steam. And I'm sure it's only a matter of time. It's probably already under development, frankly, to change the way that NFTs are used. So I'm bullish on the on blockchain in general, just not the current form of, of the way things stand. But totally agree with Al. You know, it's it's coming eventually. Um, you know, whether whether we like it or not, but it is going to be a, an interesting and unique experience to see how the uh, the central banks, you know, in general deal with it. Yep. Well, myself, I think that uh, I agree with you. I think mostly, Nick, is I think blockchain is a technology that is uh, valuable and it's solid and it's uh it's going to be a foundation for uh, lots of advancements going forward. Um, cryptocurrency could be valuable in some forms, but right now it's mostly speculation uh, type of thing, which sort of undermines the whole idea of it being a currency. Uh, and really, when you think about it, is it that different than just the dollar, which is completely untethered from the gold standard it used to be or, or whatever, it's simply worth a $10 bill is worth $10 because we say it is. How is that any different than, say, a cryptocurrency? And, you know, the answer is it isn't, I think, except it's backed by the U.S. government. So I think, you know, cryptocurrencies, but right now we're in a speculative mode. NFTs are, I think, also very compelling and for things that are more substantive and substantial than things like um, uh, some uh, windmill dunk or whatever like that. <laughs> um, so things are evolving, but right now there's so much money sort of thrown at this and there have been speculative bubbles throughout history. You know, the famous Dutch tulip bulb thing, Beanie Babies, uh, everything has been, so many things have been speculative and everybody's making a lot of money. Everybody looks great until the music stops. And then there's a lot of uh, pain to go around and people are missing out. So I think we're in a speculative sort of bubble right now and uh, the music's going to stop at some point. And then we'll get down to earth and we'll find out what things are really worth uh, when the going gets tough and over the long haul. So anyway, that's my thought. Okay, so we talked about crypto and we Bitcoin, uh, NFTs, blockchain. I think we, all, we summed it up pretty well. I think it's a sort of a nuanced view um, and there's a lot of real passionate, I like that word of yours, Bertrand, passionate proponents of it. And um, I think we got a good look at different sides of it. And uh, I think the jury's still out. We're not going to know exactly where this lands uh, for a little while yet, but uh, we'll see where it ends up. Hopefully you enjoyed the journey. So thanks for joining us here on Best Places and the team, and uh, we'll see you soon. Hi, everyone. Bye, all. Bye.